Hey, everybody. It's Amy Walter, editor-in-chief of The Cook Political Report. You're listening to The Odd Years, a political podcast designed for the off years, literally the odd-numbered years where there are no scheduled federal elections. This week, we go back to school where we get a chance to talk with two of the coolest professors of political science I know. Yeah, all right. I'm a political nerd. I actually like political scientists, but I know you're going to really enjoy them as well. They know how to do all the academic stuff, but they write and talk like, you know, normal people. They're John Sides, the William R. Keenan Jr. Chair at Vanderbilt University, and Lynn Fabrick, the Marvin Hoffenberg Professor of American Politics and Public Policy at UCLA. There are two books on our most recent presidential elections, Identity Crisis, the 2016 Presidential Campaign and the Battle for the Meaning of America, and The Bitter End, the 2020 Election and the Challenge to American Democracy, are must-reads for understanding this current political era. Their work chronicles what Baverick calls the shifting dimension of conflict in American politics, from one focused mostly on the size and scope of government to a fight driven over identity-inflected issues. There's a big reason why our politics feels angrier than ever. Fabric and Sides are clear-eyed about how and why we got here, what we should expect in 2024, and the role political leaders can and should play in helping break some of this partisan calcification. Lynn, John, I'm so excited to finally have the chance to speak with you because I quote you all, pretty much every day. Um, your your latest book, The Bitter End, your thesis of this, which is essentially that our politics is both incredibly stable and incredibly volatile at the same time, is just so brilliant. And I want to read this line in particular where you write, in sheer numbers, Democrats and Republicans are more narrowly divided than they used to be meaning any movement in elections from one year to the next could change who governs the country. This combination, and this is a key quote, the combination of calcification and parity raises the stakes of politics and makes them more explosive, which is basically what we've been living through since 2016. So Lynn, let me start with you. Help us understand how we got to this place. And then if you can, is your assumption that we're just going to keep going in this direction? Yes. Well, thanks for having us. And it's great to be here. And you're an excellent student, Amy, because that is exactly (laughs) the sentence that sort of describes the whole story of this book. Um, And to quickly explain, how did we get here? So calcification is the way we describe this state of politics that you just read. It sounds like polarization and everybody sort of knows what that is, but we think of it as polarization plus. And that plus part is really important. And so there are sort of three factors that lead us to this state. The first is an increasing sameness within each political party. So people who call themselves Democrats, people who call themselves Republicans, they're more like each other within party than they have been, say, since the New Deal, so the last 70 or so years. And then you couple that with an increasing distance between the parties. So a sameness within, but a distance between the parties. So they're farther apart on average on policy positions than they have been. And then the third factor is a shift in the things we're fighting about. So for most of my lifetime, for example, the conflict in politics was about things that came out of the New Deal, the role and size of government, the tax rate. Um, In 2008, everybody remembers Joe the Plumber. We were talking about Joe the Plumber. We're not fighting about those things anymore. We're fighting about things that are identity inflected. There's still issues. There's still things on which we have to write policy, but they are person-based, things that revolve around gender and religion and race and ethnicity. Those kinds of issues are very divisive because it's hard to compromise on those. We, we can compromise on should the tax rate be 
12 or 13 percent. Let's split the difference and go 12 and a half. And you're a little happy and I'm a little happy. You're a little sad and I'm a little sad. But we can't compromise on whether a same sex couple can be married on Monday and Tuesday. Oh, but not Wednesday and Thursday. And only if they want to be on Friday. You know, it's it's harder to compromise. And so the issues feel more divisive. On top of that is the parity that you talked about in the election and the stakes of elections feel very high. Right. That uh, all it takes is a few thousand votes in one state or the other. And we have a different majority in Congress. We have a different president. The era of the landslide is over. Let's get to then, John, this idea of the sameness within each party. I guess the irony is that we have these somewhat diverse coalitions in that we only have a two-party system. We have 300 million people in this country. We are an incredibly diverse society on every level. How is it that the party, the people within the parties themselves have become, as you say, there's a sameness. There seems to be a chicken or an egg question, right? Are they feeling the same way because the leaders are telling them this, or are they attracted to the party because it shares the same values? Great question. I think the answer is probably some of both. Both, People's partisanship tends to be a fairly stable feature of their identity, but there are changes in partisanship. People do move from party to party, you know, just the same way, you know, sometimes politicians switch parties. You can see that even in the public. And we think of that as in part a reaction, both to the political positions that the parties are taking, but also to the sort of social groups that they are identified with. And so to think of white evangelicals shifting to the Republican Party over the last several decades is not just a function of the Republican Party's positions on issues like abortion, but it's a fact that the party becomes identified with that group and features that group in a lot of different ways. You know, politicians symbolically going to Liberty University would be the most you know recent manifestation of that. But the other time, there's definitely many, many cases, and particularly in recent years, where you can ad- clearly identify that it's people changing their views in reaction to the, the ideas that they're hearing from the political parties. And so their partisanship stays the same, but their issue positions change. We saw that under the uh, Republican Party with Trump, you know, sometimes blowing this way and that, um, and changing his own mind, but also articulating positions that were a change from what the party had traditionally said, and Republicans were willing to follow along. Trade would be a great example of that. On the opposite side, in the Democratic Party, part of what Lynn was describing when she talked about the growing salience of these identity-inflected issues, where you see that in the Democratic Party is really like quite large in percentage point term shifts in the in Democrats' views of immigration, their views of Black Americans, issues related to racial justice and civil rights. All of those things are changing in part because they're both hearing different ideas and messages from Democratic Party leaders and, to be frank, reacting against the ideas associated with Trump. Exactly. So as a consequence, right, you get, you know, on the Democratic side in particular, the party of the Bill Clinton era, let's say, which where all the discourse was about how do you manage this coalition that consists, of course, of, of African Americans as a legacy of Democratic support for civil rights, but also consists of, at that point in time, still some white Southerners, other white Democrats who were more conservative on a variety of issues. That was the coalition management challenge of the Clinton years. And in many respects, that challenge has changed a great deal. And that particular challenge has lessened as the party has become more unified on those kinds of issues. Not completely unified, of course. You can pick up the headlines any day and see Democrats disagreeing with each other. But um, the, the trend, nevertheless, relative to you know decades ago is pretty clear. So, and, yeah. So, Lynn, w- weigh in on that. And also, how is it that we can have a plurality of Americans say they identify as an independent and yet they align themselves with party? Yes. So here's another interesting thing that we tease out in the book and that we were able to do um, because we have a massive amount of survey data that we've brought to bear on this project. We have 500,000 interviews with Americans over two years. And we ask each of them to play this little game where we uh, give them two baskets of goods, A and B, they have opposite policy positions and people have to choose which world they want to live in, A or B. And by doing that, we're able to suss out what 
the most important policies are to people in terms of shaping the world they want to live in. Here's an interesting thing that came out of this project for me. Um, most Americans do not have all liberal or all conservative positions on issues. Most people have a mix of positions. But on the things that we're fighting over, the things that people will say are the most important to shaping the world they want to live in, people tend to be consistently liberal or consistently conservative, and they tend to be the ideology of the party with which they identify. So they can have cross-positioned policy ideas with their party, but on things that are not priorities for them right now or for the country right now. Hmm. And sometimes where the tension comes in, this infighting within party that you're talking about, is when one group says, hey, this thing that's at the bottom of the list right now, we'd really like that to percolate to the top. And there's tension between what we're going to fight about. Independents are no different. If you're someone who identifies as an independent, but you tend to have all liberal ideas on things like immigration and abortion, uh, you're going to vote for a Democrat. If you tend to have, you're going to vote for a Republican. The independents tend to have more of a mix at the top, but they'll lean one way or another. And in large part, that is shaping how they're voting. And so that's a little bit of the difference between John was talking about people's identification with a party right. tends to be stable. Maybe you're someone who didn't grow up in a political household as a child, or you're someone who's never really engaged with the partisan political world, but you still think there shouldn't be a wall on the border and we shouldn't separate children from their families at the border. And then, you know, because there's so much information out there that the Democrats, the party that have those positions and you vote for them. Yeah. Um, We've made it this long without uttering the the word Donald Trump. Maybe once, John. John brought that up a little. Right. This is where we're going to get into this because, obviously, you all have written about this. We know that this phenomenon that we're discussing about our calcification and the volatility began before Trump came onto the scene. But you all write that he was responsible for accelerating the pace of this polarization. Um, can you, John, talk about that? And then really critically, what happens when Trump is no longer in the picture? I think there are a lot of Republicans who are secretly hoping they're going to go back to the pre-Trump days. But it seems as if he has remade the party. And if identity, as you all have noted, is the central core, it's not going to go back to fights about entitlement spending and tax rates. Yeah, that seems to be the case. <laughs> I think one when we talked about the rise of Trump in our book on the 2016 election, um, which was called Identity Crisis. One of the things we pointed out then was that, you know, there was a reservoir of sentiment already in the electorate, whether you're thinking about the Republican primary electorate or the general electorate, that was more concerned about immigration, less convinced that racial inequality was really about structural features, and more convinced that it's about, you know, Black Americans simply not trying hard enough. Those sentiments were quite present. And what Trump did was not really increase the overall level of those sentiments, but he was he made those sentiments more politically actionable. And in this context, you know, Hillary Clinton, I think, helped in her way by providing such a strong contrast with Trump. Um, so voters were better able to use their own views on these issues to make a choice on a presidential election. And so th we talk about that as, as activating these views on identity and collective issues and making them more politically consequential. I think where the acceleration comes is the changes in the dudes since Trump ran and then was elected. Um, and one of the examples that we have at the beginning of the 2020 book has to do with people's views of immigration and specifically, do they want to increase the overall level of immigration, decrease it or keep it at the same? And partisan differences on that question, which dates back to 1965, I believe, in Gallup surveys, those differences don't really emerge until the 2000s. Um, and as of the survey that was conducted immediately prior to Trump's inauguration, you know, the partisan divide was present, but not like enormous. Just so I'll give you specific numbers, like 30% of Democrats said we should increase immigration and 11% of Republicans said we should increase immigration. So in the five years 
after that point, taking us through the end of Trump's presidency, the percentage of Democrats goes from 30 to 50, right? It's a 20 percentage point swing. And the percentage of Republicans stays at almost exactly the same level. So one of the ways that we talk about that in the book is that there was as much or if not more polarization in five years as in the previous 20. Right. And that's what that acceleration looks like. So his not being in the picture then, John, whether it's this year or in the future, I mean, obviously we're seeing in somebody like Ron DeSantis, someone who seems to uh, agree with this point that Trump has accelerated these issues, that identity, it's not just recently around immigration, but also now we hear so much about wokeness, which has, there's a right. racial piece to that, of course, but also this sense of elitism. Um, we're leaving behind those vestiges of the Republican Party. We're now the working class, anti-establishment, anti-elite, um, nativist party. Is that going to hold without Trump at the center of it? Like, where do those Trump voters still show up if it's not Donald Trump leading that charge? It's a great question. My sense of where the Republican Party is right now, and this is really mostly a story about Republican Party elites and leaders, mm -hmm. not necessarily a story about voters, is that Trump's presidency has, I think, simultaneously done a couple things. One is that he made it harder to pursue a particular kind of conservative economic agenda, uh, very much in the tradition of the New Deal politics that Lynn referenced earlier. And that, I think, reached its sort of um, high point under Paul Ryan um, when he was the Speaker of the House. And there was this idea of you know reforming Medicare and entitlement programs more generally. And Trump's declaration that we have to protect Social Security, Medicare has made it really hard. So now, like when Rick Scott, the senator from Florida, floated ideas about entitlement reform um, in 2022, um, he was quickly you know slapped down um, Mitch McConnell's like, we're not going to do that. And then even more recently, Trump attacked DeSantis and, and accused him of having voted for um, these kinds of uh, changes when he was a member of Congress. And the second thing I think is, is striking is the extent to which um, the diversity of opinion within the Republican Party, even 10 years ago in terms of immigration, it's not clear I mean, it may be that that diversity still exists, but it's not clear that there's much room for the moderate faction of the party. There was a moment, I think, even under Trump, where there was a potential deal with Democrats and with others on a combination of, I think, 20 billion or so for the border wall, combined with the path to citizenship for dreamers. That got torpedoed by conservative voices, and Trump followed along with them. But for the most part, I don't really see the, the potential for those kinds of deals seems pretty circumscribed. The kind of deal that, you know, the Gang of Eight in the Senate worked out in 2013. I, I mean, I think, you know, any Republican that wants to stick their neck out, you know, you can pretty much guarantee you'll be the recipient of a nasty Tucker Carlson segment within a week. So I, I really don't know. A you week, know, I think uh, the, 10 minutes. <laughs> maybe. Exactly. I really don't know that at the end of the day, there's a larger number of Republicans who want to steer the party back toward something that is, you know, ha has a less hardline view on identity inflected issues, for example. Um, but I don't think that faction has the momentum to carry the day. And moreover, I think, you know, they are still looking around trying to figure out if um, there is a winning message in anti-wokeness and depending on the outcomes in 2024, that may be in some sense the referendum on that particular strategy. And, and so they'll keep their powder dry and wait and see what happens. Yeah, Lynn. It, I, it's a bit of a sticky situation because it's what we're fighting over right now between the parties. So if you're in the Republican Party and you want to soften on these issues, what does that mean? That means look more like the Democrats. Then you're jeopardizing your chances in the general election because you have to have contrast with the Democrats in the general election because this is what we're fighting over. So the real way for that coalition to emerge and change the current Republican Party, they have to change the dimension that we're fighting over. That's very hard. I always tell people, like, people say, oh, politics feels so awful now. Why does it just feel so different? And the answer to that is because we've just lived through something, I think, 
that is very rare. We've lived through a shifting in the dimension of conflict of American politics. And the last time that happened was the New Deal. And who knows when the next time it's going to happen is. Um, but that's not something that you do this week and next week, and then we change again before the end of the year. Right. This is huge glacial change. So this is what we're fighting over. And that's going to make that part of the Republican coalition, it's going to make it very hard for them to emerge as the defining part of the party right now. we got to be fighting over something else for that to happen. Yeah, once something's baked into the nature of the basic partisan divide, um, it's really hard to undo that. Sometimes even hard to pivot away from that toward a different issue agenda entirely. Mm. Um, and again, I don't. There might be a creative politician out there that can see an avenue, but I think what you correctly pointed out, Amy, is that right now, you know, the leading alternative to Trump is trying to act like Trump for the most part. And I don't see anybody that looks viable enough yet in 2024 to present you know, an alternative model. Well, and as you all know, what usually gets a party to change direction is that they get drubbed over and over and over again. And so Bill Clinton in 1992 coming out and saying, look, we can't keep putting these New Deal liberals in front of the public. It's not going to work anymore. But this comes back to your main point, Lynn, and, and this is my question for you. If every election is decided by the smallest of fractions, then you never really lose, right? You just, right. I just need to find 5,000 more votes next election. So is your assumption that this upcoming election will look very similar to 2016, 2018, 2020, where we've got a handful of competitive counties, states, districts, handful of votes. Yes. Yes. I think, Amy, if you asked me to bet right now, um, that's where I would put my money. That 2024 will look a lot like 2020, which looked incredibly like 2016. <laughs> um, and that's how John and our third co-author, Chris Tosanovich, in the book, The Bitter End, that's how we sort of have confidence in this idea that the dimension that we're fighting over has changed because 2016 looked pretty different from 2012. Um, but 20 looked a lot like 16. So yes, I think this is where we are. It's going to be close. And, you know, there's no reason to think it won't be largely a repeat. Right. Talk to me, though, about the fact that we could be in the middle of a recession. Who knows what Russia's going to be doing, right? We think about these big events. Well, we don't know about them, so couldn't they shift it? But as you all wrote about in The Bitter End, we had a pandemic. We had impeachment. We had a crash of the economy that looked like depression-like. And yes. still, we had an incredibly close election, right? And Trump's yes. approval ratings never really budged on a, yeah. on a significant basis. Yes, it's tempting to think that, oh, this thing will happen and it'll make everything different. <laughs> right. But we had so many things happen in the lead up to 2020, and none of them dislodged this underlying structure, this calcified state of politics. Now, you mentioned Russia, and I do think that that is that's a volatile situation. And you can imagine that going in a lot of directions that really could... Hmm potentially not reshape politics in America, but um, maybe reshape the kinds of things we're talking about for a period of time. A global war is certainly something that, that I'm willing to say has the chance of redefining the conflict for at least a brief period of time, if not longer. Uh, but man, like who's wishing for that? <laughs> right. You know, like that's just not- I also what thought a global pandemic- could right. have that impact, right? Yes. I, I, yes. I was thought, gosh, this is pretty easy. We just fight this virus. We don't have to fight right. another human. Yeah. It's the closest thing to alien invasion exactly. we've had. Um, and we still think that, that might that. That might unify Americans, but um, it could, and it could have. John likes to talk about this. It could have, but it got politicized very quickly because of this, the decisions of one political elite, and that would be Donald Trump. He could have made different choices, and it could have been a unifying moment, but yeah. his choices made it not a unifying moment. That's right. 
Lynn Fabric had to jump off a bit early, but John Sides was gracious enough to allow me a couple more questions. Beyond Yours is brought to you by the Cook Political Report team. It's our way of sharing the questions we love to ask and the conversations we enjoy having behind the scenes. If you'd like to explore more of what we have to offer, consider subscribing at cookpolitical.com slash subscribe. Odd Years listeners can use the discount code ODD10 to save 10% on any subscription. This offer is only available to new subscribers. Uh, John, one thing I wanted to ask you is getting to the source of this polarization, this time that we're living in, that, it again, it, the battle lines are so clearly and deeply drawn. And we've got the death of local news and the nationalization of our news sources. We have social media as a potential culprit. Education levels. You talked about religion, especially um, white evangelicalism, rural urban divide. I mean, I don't know, John, it feels like a lot of these things have been around a long time. Is it one or two things that really sped up this movement we have seen over the last 10 or 20 years towards polarized electorate? What do you all point to as some of the significant factors that got us here? Sure. I mean, one of the ways that we talk about the changing nature of the political parties and their distance from each other is we use the metaphor of tectonic shifts. Um, so we think about like plates in the earth slowly grinding against each other. And so some of those tectonic shifts, you know, we think of as having like several decades, if not half a century of longevity, because the Democratic and the Republican parties movement, for example, on issues related to the size of government is a really longstanding feature that has its roots in a lot of different things going on within each party, you know, the rise of the conservative movement within the Republican Party, the regional realignment, all of those things were part of that story. Um, if you want to think about, you know, identity things, that's where the changes are. There certainly were like important differences between the Democratic and the Republican parties, you know, dating back to arguably to the 30s and 40s, particularly into the 50s and 60s. But on these, on some of these issues, the changes are much more recent, and we think driven by the strategic choices that political leaders have made um, to accentuate those issues and to, I think, in some respects, try to carve both that that pushed further, you know, than previous leaders had gone. The way that Trump pushed further on immigration than even some hardliners had previously gone. And the way the Democratic Party has, has embraced certain ideas related to racial justice in ways that they hadn't done previously when the norm was to walk a much more careful line to avoid alienating racially conservative voters in the party. But part of what's magnified some of these changes more recently is the fact that those values related to issues and identity become, and now to some extent gender identity and all these things, become more central. That's what's creating the differences that we see that are based on, let's say, urban and rural, or mm -hmm. on people with more and less formal education. You know, those things are proxies for values. And when those values become uh, activated and become uh, more diagnostic in terms of how you should vote, because the parties are offering you, and the po political leaders in those parties are offering you such a sharp contrast. I think that's what helps to create some of the geographic patterns of the things that we can see on maps or the things that we can see when we look at simple demographics like education. Right, because at least in the early 2000s, John, you remember the conversation was about self-sorting, that uh, the reason we have these really deepening rural-urban divides is that where people choose to live um, is driven as much by their political values as anything else. And so if you could live in Austin, Texas, versus, say, outside of Austin, right? Further outside in a more rural area. Which would you choose? Well, you'd choose the one that fit with your identity, right? right. But I think the point you all are making, and tell me if I'm wrong, is that so much of this, though, is not that people are choosing to move to certain places, but the people who have been living there, their values now, which 
at one point might have aligned with another party now align with the opposite. So a working class Democrat or a more socially liberal, fiscally conservative Republican, they don't see themselves in the party in the way they once did on identity issues. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's exactly right. It's not that people are not attentive to, I wouldn't say necessarily the political complexion of a particular community. I mean, I don't know that people like look at voting maps, but <laughs> you know, you have a sense of the type of general values that might be part of that place. That might factor in at the margins, but most people's decisions about moving, if they move at all, right, right, are about right. job, school, those kinds of things. And so there's real constraints, I think, on people's ability to self-sort, particularly in an era where we don't have like a great deal of mobility. Right. Um, just as an empirical fact, yeah. and not a lot of people like moving across state boundaries and stuff like that. So it really is about people staying in place, but changing their views or their vote, you know, and that's what's happened, right? Take Ohio, for example, like to, to, for Ohio to go from a, a state that Obama wins by four points in 2012 to a state Trump wins by mm, eight points in 2020. That didn't happen because all the liberals moved from Columbus to New York City. Right. Or Austin. Or you know, all the happened. conservatives from around the country suddenly moved into the Mahoning Valley, right? Yeah, discovered the, discovered the beauty of the <laughs> right. of Shaker Heights. Right. Right? There's just not that much that mobility can do to create these trends. That's the same thing, true with the urban-rural divide, too. Like, that's part of what's, what's helping to create that. It's just the people in these places that are changing their political views and their votes to some extent, right? They're, to the extent that we don't have calcification, right? It's because... There are these, not necessarily massive, but certainly consequential movements in different places in the country that give the Democrats a larger advantage in the Houston suburbs and the Atlanta suburbs than they used to have and gives, you know, takes Ohio from a swing state to something that probably is now pretty reliably in the Republican call. John, I'd love for you to talk about an area of the country that you know pretty well because you're living in it, which is Nashville. And yes. what we're seeing there as indicative of a lot of what you all have been writing about now for these many years. Um, what's your sense there now you're, that you're in the middle of this, the impact between the expulsion of the legislators, the gun debate, the issues about education and what teachers can and can't do, the Nashville region seem to be moving, at least in maps that I've seen, that there has been some movement to Democrats over the years. Do you think this accelerates that now? And we see the Nashville area as basically becoming similar to Philadelphia suburbs and Chicago suburbs, or is there something else that makes Nashville harder to put into those same categories like we we talked about. Yeah, I mean, what's happened in Tennessee and in Nashville recently is a microcosm of a bunch of things that are going on in the state and in the country as a whole. So a couple observations about what that looks like. One is that, of course, you're going to get sharper differences um, in terms of politics between more urban and more rural places. But Nashville's in Davidson County and Biden got about 65% of the vote in Davidson County. So increasingly, um, there's just a sharp contrast between what people in Nashville, Memphis, to some extent, and you know, the, the more urban-ish places in Knoxville and Chattanooga look like relative to people who live outside of those cities. What I think you're also seeing is the shifts within the Republican Party towards an identity agenda you know, is really, you mentioned nationalization earlier. You can see how this carries over into Tennessee from what's happening at the federal level and what's happening in other states like, you know, Florida under DeSantis and things like that. I was struck by the fact that the governor is Republican. You know, his state of the state address at the beginning of 2023 was really focused on sort of bread and butter issues, education, infrastructure, economic development of the state. But What's going on in the Tennessee state legislature is a bill trying to essentially ban drag shows in public spaces, um, obviously a very draconian abortion bill that they've only s now slightly had to walk back. And of course, now this issue around guns and the legislators who participated in a, a pro 
gun control protest that took place within the legislative chamber after the shooting at Covenant School. I see in the Tennessee Republican Party this, I think, manifestation of what's happened elsewhere in American politics, where you move away from thinking about governance just in terms of like the economic issues that benefit the state as a whole, and you think in terms of culture war. The last piece of it, I think, is that in an era of partisan parity and calcification, when elections do come down to you know, a small number of votes and when votes in Congress come down to small majorities, Democratic or Republican, right, they're the incentive to, to change the rules to use any tactic you can use to get an advantage is there. So, of course, what happened in Tennessee, as has happened in a number of states, particularly in Republican-controlled states, right, was an exercise in, in gerrymandering after the 2020 census to eliminate a Democratic seat in Nashville, which was held by Jim Cooper, and to create three Republican-leaning districts, splitting Nashville up such that I can, like, walk 10 minutes in, <laughs> in different directions and end up in different congressional districts from my house. And so that's, you know, that combined with, again, like a tactic like expelling these legislators when censure or other options were available to you. I think the incentive to sort of escalate in any context to take advantage of the rules or changes to change the rules as needed in any context, that is one of the real risks of living in an era of polarization and partisan parity. Which is what, um, what and you I, all write it's one, about. It's one that, yeah. re, that Republicans in Tennessee, I think, are trying to, you know, leverage to their advantage. Now, the irony of that is it's not clear that it worked in the case of the expulsion of the legislators, the backlash, um, the fact that they could be reappointed to the legislature by, you know, local Nashville and Memphis political leaders within a week. Uh, I don't know that it accomplished politically what they wanted in the leaked tapes from the Republican caucus meeting that day show um, some pretty significant divides within the Republican Party on exactly how to proceed. So I don't know at the end of the day that that hardline or aggressive strategies targeting the opposite party always work. But on the other hand, they have an additional congressional seat that they didn't have. Right. Because sometimes those strategies do work. But John, I mean, as a professor of political science, we've had legislators do dirty, we can call them dirty tricks, whatever we want to call them forever and ever and ever, right? And that they didn't become national news because we didn't have CNN and we didn't have social media. And that, you know, um, there would always be these sorts, of, whether it was through gerrymandering or just these sorts of deals. Somebody gets left off a committee, crossed the leader the wrong way, and they find that their business, you know, if they're a state legislator, nobody's uh, at the, the business that they run anymore because they've been blackballed, right? So is it just that we know more about it now, or is it that it has become more bare knuckle and all or nothing? That's a great question. I do feel like a, a bit of historical perspective is valuable here. Gerrymandering wasn't invented, you know, when Republicans did it in 2010. Right. Obviously, there were election cycles in states and still are where the gerrymandering works to Democrats' advantage. I think what seems to have changed, although I will acknowledge, like getting getting good measures of this and really being attentive to like making really precise apples to apples yes. comparisons across eras is a tricky thing. Yes. But I think what people perceive is a couple of things. One is that there's just a greater willingness to weaponize these aspects of the political system to the extent possible. We're not going to go back to a world in which black Americans are not allowed to register to vote at all, but we're, you know, certainly going to see laws related to voting procedures of various kinds. There is a fear that certain kinds of practices uh, within let's say Congress or within state legislators, have changed what a couple of political scientists, Steve Levitsky and Daniel Ziblatt, have called norms of forbearance, have eroded to a certain extent. So there's no belief that if you, you know, you should be for, show forbearance towards the losers because you might be the losers the next time, right? You know, it's like when you get power, you do as much as you can possibly do to try to exercise power. I think there's certainly a lot of good anecdotal evidence for that. And you end up with tit-for-tat dynamics that I don't think ultimately lead us necessarily to the best places. 
I think also Trump played a role here, too, because one of the things that distinguished him from previous presidents and political leaders in both parties was you know, he really refused to play lip service to even fairly anodyne democratic ideals and norms. And as a result, I think he showed that you could say things, you could use words, you know, the media are the enemy of the people, that kind of thing. And there really wasn't any cost to it. Um, it wasn't that he invented hostility to, towards the news media among Republicans whole cloth. That's been a longstanding critique um, by members of the party. It's just that he showed you could change the nature of how you did it and you can make the attacks sharper and uglier and without any particular political cost. And so at the end of the day, you said this earlier, you know, what tends to tame a political party's ambitions is losing. And I don't think that we've seen the results that would lead political leaders, particularly in the Republican Party, to reconsider. And so I don't know. I don't, at the end of the day, I don't know what creates the incentive to exhibit more forbearance to your opponents. Um, And that may be part of why politics will continue to feel bitter for some time to come. John, final question for you. Can you leave us with any optimism about this? I'm sure you get this question all the time because I do too, right? Oh my gosh, are we just going to live? We're just destined to live in this moment until it breaks. And as you pointed out, you, we don't know when new systems, the, the, what you call the change in dimension, uh, will happen again. But the worry people have is it, the only way out is maybe either violence or some sort of literal disintegration of our current democracy. Are you in a similar thinking on that? Yeah, I can see a pathway out um, in theory, uh, or not out, but a pathway to something that looks a little bit like de-escalation, at least. Um, But I don't know how likely it is. Um, You pointed out one way, right, is to have a different axis of competition or a different issue that or dimension that becomes salient. And Typically speaking, that works best when it divides the parties internally as opposed to dividing one party from the other. But lots of different issues are pretty well aligned with partisanship. I don't quite know what's the magic issue that's sort of floating around out there. So I do feel like what de-escalation might look like is politicians who are willing to make somewhat different choices. There And so I'll give you an example from Tennessee, and I apologize that I'm not going to remember his name, but he's a Republican representative from Murfreesboro, which is a, a, a city, it's kind of a suburb of Nashville, maybe half an hour's drive from where I live. And he was one of those handful of Republicans who didn't vote to expel any of them, I believe. And one of the comments he made justifying his choice, first of the thing he said, it was, I think that's what my constituents would have wanted in Murfreesboro is not as red a community as some of the more rural communities certainly are. But he also said something along the lines of, well, it was also Holy Week. And I felt like, you know, that was the appropriate thing to do in a week when we're invited to think about what Christians think about in Holy Week. And I was so struck by that, um, not just because I'm married to an Episcopal priest (laughs) and and the son of a pastor myself, but I was just thinking to myself, you know, there is a person who was willing to, out of what I'd say, his personal beliefs and his personal sense of, of, you know, what is right and wrong is to make a different choice. And so I never would want to say, like, it, 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 politicians' hands are tied, you know, they are to a certain extent, you can't completely change what your party stands for. You can't c- change every activist's mind in your party uh, so you can steer the party in the different directions. But I do think that, you know, leaders are confronted with moments where they do have some agency. They can make choices. So the question is, you know, are there leaders who are going to come to the fore who are willing to make somewhat different choices? And I am conscious, um, as I know you are, that like, you know, making predictions in politics is hard enough in the short term. Uh, it's very hard in the long term. Um, you know, no one would have predicted Trump in 2004, I right. think. Right. Um, so I would say 
I, I want to, I think, exercise, you know, keep some humility here and, and say there, maybe there are some interesting paths that are just difficult to consider or to imagine right now, but that might lead us to a place um, where politics isn't quite as, as angry as it is every day today. Again, I don't know that that's the most likely course, but I want to say that we are we should live in a in a fog of pessimism, you know, in perpetuity. John, thank you so much for doing this. And in fact, <clears throat> I'm going to ask you one more question that's going to go for <laughs> our this is the fun round. Yeah. Um where I've asked uh, every one of our guests to think about the first elected official you met and interacted with personally. Do you remember who that person was or had an impact on you? Um, I was tipped off about this question ahead of time <laughs> by your producer. Good, good. I've been dredging through my own memory, and I want to say it was former Representative David Price mm -hmm. from North Carolina, he was the representative of the area around Chapel Hill and Durham where I went to college, but I don't remember meeting him until like maybe my late twenties. Um, and I met him at an event where, you know, he wasn't there to be on like display exactly. Yeah. He might've been on a panel or something, but otherwise he was just hanging out with a, a large number of people that had gathered. So you were remember... one of these kids that always thought, oh my gosh, I am so into politics and you collected yeah. buttons and, and like <laughs> signatures and stuff. Did you do any of those things? No, you know, I do remember certainly like running for office and stuff and, and school, but like, I think that was almost just sort of something I felt like I was supposed to do. I don't think I really had like, uh, like electoral politics, you know, in the, at the state, local or national level, like it, it completely in my blood. Like I wasn't totally a nerd on that, but I will say the counter like example to that is I did read Richard Ben Kramer's what it takes oh, in no. high school, which is, as you know, this like long, richly reported account of the 1988 presidential election. And I don't think if you're like 16 or 17 years old, you're reading that book, unless there might be something in it that appeals to you down the road. Um, but I think like a lot of somewhat history slash social science oriented students, I just thought I was going to be a lawyer or something <laughs> like that. And so it really wasn't until later on in my college years that I thought it was actually interesting to do social science as opposed just to following politics. I didn't do a lot of like college Democratic or college Republican type stuff. So it was just sort of happenstance that I happened to run into to Price. What I remember of that conversation um, was just that it was possible to talk like to a politician as a normal as person, a nor normal person yeah. who had something in common with me that he had gone to UNC Chapel Hill, you know, um, and he wasn't had he an reactions. academic as well? He right? had a PhD yeah. in political science yeah. of all things. So like we were just, you know, you just, it's just like when you meet somebody and you find out that you both, you know, you both root for the like Washington capitals or, you know, or, or whomever, and you just end up talking right. about something you have in common. Right. All right. Here is the last personal question, uh, which I thought was great that one of our folks here asked about, which is whether what you're seeing on campus, if the conversations in classrooms on campus are as calcified as the quote unquote adults uh, in Washington and uh, in politics in general? Yeah, it's a great question. So I think there's two ways into that. I mean, I think if you were to do surveys of students, um, you would see that Democratic and Republican-leaning students have really different views. But on the other hand, I think, there's, I think there's two things. One, I think, is that, you know, we're relatively fortunate at Vanderbilt to have a campus culture that I think has pretty good norms of tolerance and respect. I'm not suggesting that there aren't challenging conversations. I'm not suggesting that people might occasionally, you know, not want to express a political viewpoint for, at risk of creating conflict. But I do feel like we don't have not had the same kinds of very public knockdown, drag out fights, particularly around, you know, our speakers being interrupted by protesters and stuff like that. 
So that may just reflect a little bit of, of the, the dynamic that we have on this campus. The other thing I'll say is that as a political science professor, um, yeah, you know, one thing I think that I, we can bring to the table, at least in, in the classes that we teach, is, you know, we're, we're trying to help students understand things as, as analysts. Like, we're not trying to help them explain it and, and understand the, the who, why, where questions. And so one of the ways in which I think we can have um, classes that talk about divisive political issues is by just spending some time learning and using ideas from social science or from other parts of um, academic discourse study to understand the things that we're talking about. Right, and so to some extent, like I try to orient my classes, in, you know, which which include like the introduction to American government. So you know, oftentimes first year students, sometimes in their very first semester, um, as well as classes for political science majors. I try to orient them around those questions so that we're, you know, they're just more intelligent political observers and citizens. You know, obviously, if I stopped having a conversation about like let's understand the majority and minority perspectives in Dobbs v. Jackson women's health. And I said, should abortion be legal? We can have a, an argument about, like, should abortion be legal or, and then under what conditions? I'm sure that would be different views in the class on that. But, you know, as citizens, they're, part of their role is to understand, like, why, why are judges making these decisions? What are the justifications they offer? Do I find them to be persuasive or not? What is the opposite side say? So, you know, orienting conversations around um, explanation and analysis to me is one way in which we can deal with divisive issues, but, you know, emerge knowing more and, and understanding more without having to have a debate about principles and the rightness or wrongness of any one person's position on the issue. Yeah, that sounds very good, John. Well, I'd love to be able to come and take your class. That would be so be fun. Anytime. All right, I'm going to come on down you know, it's probably beautiful weather right now. Azaleas are probably out. Yeah. Mm, great food. The whole deal. Uh, the only downside right it, now, it seems to be whether I'm going to get waylaid by some sort of bachelorette party, um, you know, mashup. The national, the national capitalists. You uh, are. Bachelorette parties. You are. Um, but if you, yeah, I don't know. Like, you, you, you don't. You could probably just join in. They'll give you a T-shirt, you know, with like rhinestone <laughs> studded, like mess, you know, in the, the cowboy hats. And, yeah. And you could you could put on the uniform and go downtown. That's and, totally and my jam. That's that's check out the honky tonk. That's what I do. I love just crashing a good bachelorette party. Uh, thank you, John Sides, for all you do. Thank uh, and uh, thank I, you, I really look forward to talking to you again soon. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning into the Odd Years podcast. We hope you're enjoying these interviews, but we need your help. One of the best ways to support our podcast is by leaving a review, just a few words about what you like about the show. Your review not only helps us know what we're doing right, but it also helps other people find the Odd Years. Speaking of helping other listeners find the Odd Years, please share your favorite episode or the show with someone you think might enjoy these conversations. On behalf of our team, Thank you for your support. The Odd Years is brought to you by the Cook Political Report and is produced by Allie Flynn and Catherine Hamm.